King James Bible. Second yeah. Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter nine. Second Corinthians. Yeah, Second Corinthians, chapter eight and chapter nine. Remember that. That's those two chapters, especially deal with finances and giving, and blessings of the Lord, and the Lord's direction and instructions about giving. Second Corinthians eight and verse and chapter nine. But we're going to be in chapter nine right now. Giving, it is so important. Let's read from Brother David Cloud. A paragraph here. He says, churches that desire, since we can't have them in our church very much, he's in Nepal, that's a, that's a long way from Cleveland, Ohio there. Anyways, churches that desire God's richest blessings must get 100% involved in missionary work. That is the Lord's heartbeat. <coughs> he emphasized this by repeating the Great Commission five different times in the Gospels and the book of Acts. According to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, church is to seek to reach its own city, its own region, which is a larger area than a city, uh, and the world with the gospel. Let me repeat that paragraph, that sentence. According to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, church is to seek to reach its own city, its own region, and the world with the gospel. Such a great task cannot be accomplished in our own might or through our own resources. It can only be accomplished by faith in God. One evangelist challenges the churches with these words. What will God give through you that he will not first give to you? Think about that. Let me repeat that also. What will God give through you that he will not first give to you? So if you expect to give something, you have to have something to give, is what he's saying here. And God does provide things we have. What will God give through you that he will not first give to you? That summarizes the attitude that we must have in fulfilling the Great Commission. When we step out in obedience, we can expect God's blessing and provision. I like that. When we step out in obedience, we can expect God's, God's blessing and provision. Heavenly Father, please help us I preach this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the excitement of this hour, too. It's a time when we can give. Giving. Uh, Christians give. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ gave his own life. Just like God so loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. So, Lord, we learn from your Bible that definition in John 3, 16, that love gives. Gives. So thank you, Father, for that definition. And help us to follow that example. Your example, the Lord's example. Help us to help me now as I preach. Help me to preach. Make these things clear. To challenge people. To lead them to the place of blessing in their lives. Through this area of giving and giving. In Jesus' name I pray and ask it now. Amen. 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 Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning verse 1. We'll read there. <clears throat> This area of finances, giving, I've seen handled badly over the years. I mean, if you want to be real honest, I'll be real honest with you this morning. I've seen them handle handled real well. They, they, like I said, try to put people on guilt trips and kind of twist their arms. And that's not what, that's not God's way. And I don't want that to be our way in our church. I don't want to be that way as a pastor either. But I know that this church will be behind the blessing, in this area of blessing, of finances, there's God's blessings too. Great blessings here, too. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, the minister to those saints who are Christians, is superfluous, and those I, I, don't, I shouldn't have to say it too much, superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you, uh, to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago when your zeal had provoked very many. Some were giving so faithfully it motivated others to give too. Paul's bringing this to their memory. Verse 3. 
Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you uh, should be in vain on this behalf, that as I said, he may be ready. So Paul was saying this, put very bluntly and in clear terms, Paul was saying, I've been bragging about your church, these other churches, that you're going to give a certain amount, you're going to give towards this uh, financial need. Now when I get there with these other men from this church to take it back to the church, don't embarrass me by not having it there, not having it ready. He promised you're going to do something. I've been telling him you're going to do all this. Now when I get there, don't embarrass me. You say, that's what it says in verse 3. Read it. Read it. See what answer you come up with. Uh, that ye may, uh, that yet have I sent the brethren, at least what I've said, lest our boasting of you, I've been bragging about you, telling the people about you, boasting of you, even the word, word boasting is used there, should be in vain on this behalf. That as I said, ye may be ready. Don't make Wow, don't make a liar out of me. Is that what he's saying in verse 3? Ah, sort of. That sounds kind of crude to say it that way. But now verse 4. Let's happily, let's happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. I've been talking about your unit word boasting and used here several times. If we get there and find it's not true, we're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be embarrassed. Now verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren, be a reminder, that they would go before unto you and make a beforehand your bounty, what you promised to give, get it together, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. In other words, our motive is right. Our motive is right. Then verse uh, 6. But this I say, now here is an important truth. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the end result of this kind of giving depends on how we give. How we give. If we give sparingly, the blessings will be sparing. If we give bountifully, the blessings will be bountiful. It all depends on us and how we give. By the way, people have mentioned about our church and how generous we are. You know why we're, we, we have all this, this good amount of faith ground? Because people are generous in our church. And not God then blesses our church for, for that reason. Now verse 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. In other words, what I can say, I don't put people on guilt trips. Let people give as they want to. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. If you can't give happily, don't give, period. I mean that. If you ask me, you really mean that? I mean that. And I've said that before, too, many times. And the money just, the, the needs are met. The mission, the mission goal that we have, it's amazing. People are amazed at how much money our church gives to missions. One lady goes to another church, not even a Baptist church, but she looked at our mission booklet. She, looked at, she said, I'm embarrassed for our church. You make us look so bad at our church by your missions and your missions giving. I thought that was a good testimony. Now verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that he having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. Those are the words I emphasize there. Verse 9. As it is written, he had dispersed abroad, he had given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply, multiply your seed so, so you can do more. As we give, God allows us, to, enables us to give more. Amen. As we give, we can give more. And increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything and all, to all bountifulness. It's more than just this one area that God bless in all kinds of different areas, all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Praise the Lord for what he does for us. Amen. So we start. Now turn to Luke chapter number 6. Back up to the Gospel of Luke chapter number 6. Getting the blessings, the blessings from God. I'm going to begin my outline now. The outline, as usual, is in the, in the bulletin, too. 
The first blessing, the blessings, talk about blessings that are given when people give faithfully. The blessing on the givers. Note that. First of all, the blessing is on those who give, not on those who don't give. That should be clear enough. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Notice the first word in verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, give. You see, we start this whole procedure. What we're about to read in the rest of the verse, in verse number 38, it all begins with that first word, and it's something that we do, give. Now the rest follows after this. The rest are consequences of that first word, give. When we give, then it says, and it shall be given unto you. As we give it away, it's given unto us. Not the same thing in different ways, in different things, but give and it shall be given unto you. Blessed are the givers. Then it says, it will be given unto you good measure, uh, pressed down, like when you fill up, I've always heard this illustration, of a bushel basket being filled with grain, and they press it down, they fill it up to the top, and they press it down, shake it together, it says, oh, it says shake it together there, and shake it together, and running over, then shall men give unto your bosom. In other words, as we give out to the Lord's work here, and to these needs that He directs us, and instructs us to give, we're going to get it back much more than we've given out. Amen. Through this world's systems. See, and shall man give unto your bosom. God's not going to snap his fingers up in heaven and another thousand dollars is going to appear in your bank your checking account. That's not how it works. God works through this system in this world. As we give, we're generous it, 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 through giving towards his work here, then God blesses us by different situations in our life where maybe we get a, well, blessings. I'll just leave it that. Blessings in our life in different ways that God provides. But we have to start it. The first word there in verse 38 is give. That's what we have to do. We don't stop and wait until God gives to us, then we'll give. No, we give first. And then that starts a process. That starts uh, uh, different things happening. And those different things that are happening are all good things that happen. So we start by giving. Give, and it shall be given unto you. It's not reversed there in the first part of that verse. It's not that it's given unto us and then we give. Right. It's given then we're, it's given unto us. Good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over shall man give into your bosom. For with the same measure that he meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. How you give, what you give, the way you give, the generosity that you give, that's how you get it back. Like we read already in 2 Corinthians 9. So more, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Also in Acts chapter 20, it talks about that. But number one, the blessing is on the givers. Give, and then it shall be given unto you. Number two of my outline. So number one, the blessing is on the givers. Number two, the blessing is on the generous. The generous Proverbs. Back in the Old Testament, of course, Job, Psalms. Proverbs 11 and verse 24. The blessings on the generous. What is a generous person? How would you describe a generous person? Being generous. It means you're, you're happy to help others. There's a willingness to help others when they have a need. You're generous in that way. That means if you're generous, you'll even give what you need sometimes. You want to give generously to God's work. You want to give generously to His work. You want to give even generously to missionaries, of course. That's how one way it applies. But to be happy to do that, too. To give generously to God's work. It's to be gracious giving. It's unselfish giving. Now, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. It says here in verse 24. And here, here we see the same in fact, this is the third time we've seen this concept here in, in, in Scripture. The third time we've seen this concept. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. As we give away, then we can get. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. It's almost written here like it's a surprise to somebody. That's hard to believe. There is that scatter. Those people that scatter, they give away. And yet they seem to get more than they give away. Even. They seem to increase by giving things away, you increase. Mm -hmm. By having less yourself, you get more. That's true. Isn't that a strange a, a teaching in the Bible? Yeah. 
There's that scatter, the yet increase it, and then the opposite. And there is that withholdeth more than is me. Now, this doesn't say you, have to, you should withhold everything uh, or give away everything, but you withhold more than is me. You're, you're holding back more than you really should or more than you really can. So withholdeth more than is me, but it tendeth to poverty. So in verse 24, you see someone who is who blessed with abundance, and you see someone who comes to poverty. How does that happen? You get abundance by giving away. You get become poor by keeping things more than you should. See the difference there? In one verse, one verse, it tells you how to become wealthy, and that's more than financially wealthy. We're talking about a lot of different areas of wealth. It teaches you how to be wealthy. It teaches you how you're going to become to, come to poverty. All in one verse. Isn't that great? Isn't the Bible wonderful? Even the, isn't the Bible rich in what it teaches about these things? There is that scam of the end increases, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Now verse 25, we're going to use a word here. Don't understand this word in its political <laughs> definition. Yes. I want to warn you ahead of time. Good. Don't understand this word politically. It's not talking about politics. Right. It's not talking about government. It's not talking about liberals and politics. In fact, Christians are the opposite of the liberals in politics. If you didn't know that, you should know this morning. Now verse 25, the liberal soul shall be made fat. Good illustration. The one who is liberal, generous, that word means generous. The generous soul, the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Those that try to help others, they're going to be helped more than they're even helping others. And the more you help others, the more you're going to be helped. And the more you give away to others, the more you're going to have yourself. Amen. Now, remember that one verse where it says, more than is me. You need to pay your own bills. You need to pay for yourself. I, I've known at least one example of this where somebody thought they should give away all their money all the time, and their family went without food. Wow. Now, that's not right either. That's not right either. You need to be generous, but you need to take care of your own. He that you know, takes care of his, needs to take care of his own too. But verse 25, the liberal, generous soul Shall be made fat. That's what the blessings come by giving things away. He that water shall be watered also himself. He, he that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him. But blessing, that's what we're talking about, the blessing of giving. But blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. By the way, it didn't say give it away, or either did it. Selleth it. See, the Bible talks about prosperity, even economically. The Bible talks about a buying and selling. That's not wrong. That's, in fact, that's God's way. Business is God's way. You need to learn that from the Bible. That's not my lesson for this morning, though. But shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's economics, isn't it? Yep. You need to understand that, too. And he that diligently seeketh good broker, create favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him and go the wrong way and come back at you. So the blessings of missions giving. Number one, there's blessings on the givers. There's blessings on the generous. Number three, there's blessings on the poor also, on the poor. A couple different references here, but let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 now. Back to 2 Corinthians but chapter 8 now. Oh, the blessings, the blessings here. You know, if I don't preach on money, and I don't like to preach on money, honestly, this is, this is sort of preaching on money, but not as much as some do. But anyways, but the blessings are here to behind this door. If there's blessings on the other side of the door, I want to go through the door. And if this is the door, I want to open that door. Because I want the blessings of God here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he, he was rich, of course, he was in heaven with all the glories and the honor of heaven as he deserves, and, and he's back there now too, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He left the glories of heaven and the honor that he got in heaven to come to this world. Some people say, boy, if I could see God, I'd believe on you. Look what happened when he did come to this world. Look how they treated him. That's right. He was here. Yep. They did see him. Look how they treated him. Shall we, he became poor 
that he through his poverty, through his poverty, might become rich. So for one person to become rich, another one has to become poor. It's the one kind of teaching here, isn't it? And then also verse 12. Verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. In other words, God only expects you to deal with and be faithful in what you do have, not what you don't have. I've, had, I've heard people say, they, they've honestly said this to me, Pastor, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give half to the church. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's two problems, main problems with that. Number one, don't play the lottery. Yeah. Don't right. do that. Right. And secondly, I don't believe you. Right. <laughs> it's according to man hand. When the lady was talking about salvation, she was very interested. She says, I, I, what should I do now? What should I do? I, I'm interested. I don't know what to do. I says, here's what you do. Do what you know you're not doing already. Start there. What should you be doing? Well, I guess I should read the Bible. Okay. Start doing what you know you're not doing already. Don't worry about what you don't know yet. <laughs> don't worry about that. God will show you different things. But what you do know already is what you need to be doing. Well, I'm not reading the Bible. Start reading the Bible. You know you should do that. Well, I don't go to church. Well, you know you should go to church. I know you should go to church, but I don't go. Well, start going to church. Start doing the things you're not doing already that you know you should be doing. That's how you start with everything. Read the Bible. I know I should read the Bible. Well, read the Bible. Take time. Well, I gotta, I'm tired on Sunday mornings. Well, get out of bed. Then read out later on in the day. Come out to church on Sunday morning. Do the things you know you're not doing already that you're already being disobedient about. Start to be obedient in the things that you know you need to be obedient about and the things that you know you're not being obedient about. Start doing the things you're being disobedient about. Well, I'm getting tongue-tied up here. I better move on. But you get what I'm trying to say. People know, know they're not doing the things they should be already. They don't need to know more. They just need to start obeying what they already know they're not doing. Amen. amen. Well, I wish I could sit out there and say amen to that. I'd say amen to that. Amen. They need to start doing what they know they're already not doing. They're not reading the Bible. Read the Bible. They're not going to church. Go to church. Yes. Yes. All right. According to a man had, not according to a man not. They know already what they're not doing right. All right, so the blessings. The blessings are on the poor. You might not have much now, but what you do have, be faithful in what you do have. Be generous in what you do have and see how the Lord works on that day, uh, in that principle. See how the Lord does work there. There's the, yeah, there's the financially poor, but there's the spiritually poor also. That's right. And many times when the Bible talks about the poor, the poverty, they're not just talking about financially poor, right. although they're making the application there, but they're drawing up a, a picture there of those who are spiritually poor. Spiritually poor. And there's one article in the last, I think it was the last newsletter, called The Truly Poor. Those who are really poor. The truly poor in America are not those who lack money, but those who lack purpose. Handing out welfare checks does nothing to cure this poverty in the poor or in us. In the main, Poverty is not caused by a lack of money. Poverty is caused by a loss of values. Well, that's good. Not a lack of money, a loss of values. A society that ignores or opposes a set of core standards, the standards which motivate people to work, to stay married. If you're married, stay married, he says here. Number three, to exercise self-control. Self-control about things. And number four, be honest. Be honest about things. Exhibits a poverty of spirit that no amount of money can enrich. Those are some areas there. The truly poor in America are not those who lack money, but those who lack purpose. You know, you can find some people that don't have a lot of money, even on poverty level, but they go to church. They have a purpose to their lives. Right. They might not have a lot of money. And the Lord blesses, provides in different ways. Yeah, we know that too. 
but they have a purpose for life. You can have a purpose, spiritual purpose for your life without having a lot of money. That's what they're saying here. So there's a blessings on the poor. Be faithful to what God has given you. He's not holding you accountable for what you have not, but what you do have. So be faithful to what, even what little you might have. Be faithful in that, and God will bless there. So the blessings of bishops given, the blessings on giving, on the givers, given and shall be given unto you. The blessings on the generous, the generous ones. The blessing on those who are poor, God will bless there too in that area. The widow's might, what a great example that is. The Lord said after the widow gave her one cent, and those Pharisees and other wealthy people that gave their gold and jewelry, thousands if not a uh, total of maybe a million dollars. I'm working on a new message. I'm trying to get more thoughts in, into it. When Jesus was judged, when he was still here, when he was still on this planet, the times when Jesus worked as a judge, and he judged things before the great judge. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. What's the he was judging that this widow gave more than all those wealthy people gave. She gave more. He was making a judgment there. This poor little lady, I don't know if you can uh, describe her best you can, just however you want to. But he said, in his just estimation and his judgment, he said she gave more than all they did. So poor, if you're in, in the poverty level, I don't know if there's anybody even like that in our church today. But the, those that have less money and poor, they can still be blessed to the Lord. They can still give. Give what they do have in that way. And God will bless them. So there's blessings on the poor. There's blessings on givers. There's blessings on the generous. There's blessings on the poor. And there's blessings on the wealthy too. Friends, it's not wrong to have money. If two things are true. It's not wrong to have money if two things are true. Number one, if you've got it the right way. And number two, if you're using it the right way. Those two things. If you've got it the right way and you're using it the right way, it's not wrong to have money. Some of the well-known men in the Bible, people in the Bible were wealthy. Job was the wealthiest man in his land at that time. Wealthier than anyone else. And God used that as a test, allowed that to be used as a test. And Job did not sin even that, and God gave him back. You know, in the Bible, I like it when there's the rest of the story. It didn't just stop with Job losing all he had, his ten kids and all his wealth and his personal life. It didn't stop there. It went on beyond that, didn't it? Yes, sir. There's the rest of the story. I always liked that, too. The rest of the story. Go on further on, that, on those stories. There's the rest of the story. So Job was one that was very wealthy. Joseph became the second most powerful man in Egypt. In fact, he really was the most influential because he handled all the money and all the wealth of Egypt, even over Pharaoh. Pharaoh was looked upon literally as a god. Yes, he was. But Joseph handled all the money. Give me the money part any day. <laughs> Joseph, so Job was wealthy. Joseph was, and these are good examples in the Bible. Uh, Abraham. Abraham, very wealthy man in his day and age there at that time. Abraham was. And what about Boaz? Yeah. The kinsman redeemer. A type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had the money to bail out his relatives. Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Job, Joseph, Abraham, Boaz. Other ones in the Bible were brought up too. But those, those are the ones that you know the most. And in Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 it says, It is God who giveth thee power to get well. So blessings on the wealthy. Praise the Lord that you have money. Praise the Lord you live in America today. Uh, the wealthy is one of the wealthiest nations. Now, uh, there might be some other nations in, in that spot. But we in America are wealthy people. Be glad for that. Make sure you got the money in the right way, number one. And number two, what's that second one? Use it the right way. Use it the right way. The blessings on the wealthy. God bless. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have a savings account. In, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about parents and grandparents who save the money for their kids and their grandkids. And that's the right thing to do, the Bible says right. there. So it's not wrong to have a savings, but use it the right way. And don't keep back more than is meat. Yeah. Well, it keeps going back to that thought. More than is meat. There's a certain amount you need to keep for yourself and pay your own bills. But if you have money and you're wealthy, number one, make sure you've got it the right way. Number two, make sure you use it the right way. So there's blessings on the poor. 
There's blessings on the wealthy. There's blessings on the workers. The workers also. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Hebrews on the workers and servants. And I'll add in the last point here. The co-laborers with Jesus Christ himself. Hebrews. There's blessings on those that are working. If you were to consider getting a job, or you have a job now, one of the things you consider is, what is the company like? What are the owners like? What is my boss on the job going to be like? You consider that, don't you? And sometimes you might say, I don't want that job because of the people on the job there. I don't like the ownership of that company, so I'm not going to work there because of the people I'm going to be working for and the people I'm going to be working with. Some places I don't, wouldn't want to work because of the people I'm working for and the people I'm working with. When you're involved in missions, you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're working with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're co-laborers within. When we're involved in missions, missions giving, missions work, and other ways too, we're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is His commission. This is His command. Uh, when we're working in missions, we're working with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God also convicting people, leading people. The Lord Jesus Christ directing people. All these things are so important. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your, your work and labor, labor of love. I've heard that little phrase many times. Labor, it's a labor of love, they call it. It's a labor to work with something I love doing. Pastoring a church, preaching these messages. It's a labor, it's a work. I have to spend hours in getting ready for these times, getting Sunday school outlines done and if I give you a list of all the jobs I had to do, you'd feel sorry for me, probably bring a tear to your eye. I think, oh, poor pastor. But it's a labor, it's a labor of love. Amen. I do this because I love the Lord. Amen. I do this because I love Christians. Amen. I love Christians. It's a labor of love. For God is not unrighteous. There's some of two negatives there, huh? But God is not unrighteous. So it means he is righteous. To forget your to forget your work and labor, yeah, God's not going to forget what you've done for Him. God has a perfect memory. You know, God knows everything going on in this universe from the, the minus little atom, atom in this entire universe, which we can't even see the end of. He knows everything going on every second, every second. He knows what's going on. God remembers what we've done for Him, and He hasn't forgotten it. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor, love which he has shown towards his name, for his honor and glory first. That's why we're here, first of all, to honor the Lord. For his name, in that he have ministered to the saints and do minister. He ministered unto the saints, other Christians. And we desire that every one of you show the due diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. But the main thought here is the workers. We're workers and we're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the scenes that the Bible paints and the Bible talks about and writes about here and it's when the Lord Jesus Christ washed the feet of his own disciples. Amazing. Amazing. He was in heaven's glory before all this, before he came to this world. Uh, angels at his beck and calls would say, they always paint the picture of how glorious it was in heaven. And it was, and still is, and always will be. We know that too. But I think, and he left all that. He left all that to come into this world and be treated like he was. And was so humble of himself to bow down there, kneel before Peter, and wash his feet. As I understand it, that the washing of the feet was the, the lowest servant's job in the household, was to wash the people's feet. That was the, of all the servants, that was the lowest servant's job. And there was the Lord Jesus Christ washing the feet of his disciples. What a humbling work he did. If Jesus can humble himself and serve other people, we certainly can. That's right. Or are we too proud to do that? Are we too good to do that? Are we too good of Christians to do that? But here was Jesus Christ himself doing this. And so we serve. 
we serve as workers, as servants. There's nothing wrong with being a servant. Nothing wrong at all. It all depends on who you're serving. Right. And we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad I work for this company. Amen. I'm glad I work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm glad I work with those that I work with. Yeah, there's problems, there's difficulties, there can be God. I know all that, but I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to do these things. Amen. I don't want to dishonor Him. I don't want to quit too soon. People ask me something, Pastor, when are you going to retire? First of, all, first of all, the thought that passes through my mind is, why are you asking that? <laughs> is it like you want me to retire or something? No, I know, I know you're not. I, you're not. I know you're not doing that. You're just kind of wondering about it. And that's all right to wonder about things, but I'm glad I work for this company. Amen. I really, really like my boss. <laughs> I really do. Who's ever had a better boss than the Lord Jesus Christ? I like my company. I like my boss. I like being a servant in this way. Servants did important jobs. Servants did necessary jobs. Yes, sir. Servants, Jesus Christ said there in the Gospel of John, I, I call you not servants. I call you friends. Mm -hmm. Friends. What a blessing that was. The blessings of missions giving, giving, missions giving in particular, the blessings on givers, given, it shall be given unto you. Believe that. Blessings on the generous people, uh, be generous, liberal, that word generous, liberal means generous there. The blessings on the poor, even if you don't have a lot, you can be blessed of God. The Lord bragged about that widow and the might that she gave more than all the others and how much they gave. The blessings on the wealthy, it's not wrong to have money. As long as you got it the right way and you're using it the right way, God even blesses those. He gives power to get wealth, it says in there, Deuteronomy 8.18. Look at that verse later. The blessings on workers and servants and co-laborers with the Lord Jesus Christ, getting on the gospel. What is faith? What is biblical faith? Biblical faith is believing what the Bible says. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. Do you believe the Bible on this subject also when it talks about giving and all the blessings that are attached to it? Believe what the Bible says about every subject. Salvation, no. Family, right. A doctrine, yes. Churches, yes. But believe about giving also and what the Bible says about that. To. Yeah. Heavenly Father, bless now as we give a verse of invitation. Give people a time to come forward here, kneel down and pray, pray about things. Also, Lord, maybe someone this morning wants to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for them. We plead for them. We're more concerned about them than they, than they maybe ever know. Because you love them. You care about them, too. That concern we have for them is from you. So we pray for them. So bless this special time, very special time, prayer time, invitation time. In Jesus' name now I pray and ask it. Amen.